The title of today's sermon is Being Merciful Like Our Heavenly Father. And we're going to look at this today. This is a very, very wide subject. And today, certainly, we'll not be able to cover every aspect in a short sermon. But it's, uh, it gives us a glimpse into the heart of God and the heart that God gives to His people. So we're going to look at that today, and we'll have the scripture reading from Luke 6, 27 to 38. And Esther will do the scripture reading for us. But I say to you, who hear? Well, let me start that again. But I say to you, who hear? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you you use it will be measured back to you. And that was Luke seven verses, or sorry, Luke six verse twenty seven to thirty eight. These are the words of the living God. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching us how to be as children of God. Amen. As we uh, consider these verses, it's very important to, uh, to realize who we are as God's people. And there are a few places in the Bible which describes who we are as God's people. And one that I chose was uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10, which reads the following manner. For you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And um, Peter was writing to the church. He was writing to people who had been dispersed. But it's, it's important to understand that you know, not the whole world is called in this special way today. That there are certain people that God is calling to himself during this age to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the good news of who he is. And we are God's possession. We are called out ones. Everyone who belongs and is united to Christ, we are called out ones. And it's also important to, as we read and consider these verses that we've just read in the scripture reading, that we consider the difference between the Old and the New Covenant, just very briefly, And realizing that the new covenant is based on better promises. And that is very important to realize as well, because otherwise if we get the two mixed up, it it creates confusion. And we need to realize that Jesus is victorious for us all. So the Apostle Paul writes about this. He says, that's in uh, Romans 5.16, In the Old Testament, it talks about 
judgment, one sin, condemnation. In the New Testament, it talks about gifts, get the gift, many sins, justification. So this is a complete reversal of, of what, it was, what was happening with, and the new beginning that Jesus gave, that in spite of the many sins, human beings are justified when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, receiving his justification. Then Adam, Adam's trespass, death reigned. When Christ came, Christ's grace and righteousness ring in life in Romans 5.17. So until Jesus Christ died and was raised from the dead, then death reigned. There was no hope beyond the grave. When Jesus came, he reversed all of this through his grace and righteousness. So it's a very new beginning that Jesus has begun. Then there's one trespass in the Old Testament, condemnation for all. So all were condemned because the Old Testament could not give eternal life. In fact, we read in, in the Gospels that the law kills and the Spirit gives life. The law tells us that we are sinners. Basically, it cannot give life. And in the New Testament, one act of righteousness, what Jesus did on the cross for all of us, justification and life for all. Complete reversal from death for to everyone, condemnation to all, to justification and life for all in Jesus Christ. A completely new thing. In the Old Testament, the disobedience of Adam, many were made sinners. All were made sinners. In, uh, and then, in, 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 that's all in Romans 5.19, the New Testament, obedience of one will make many righteous. See, Paul had a, a very big view of the future. He did not say it would make few righteous. He says, make many righteous. Because all who accepts Christ's revelation of who he is through the Holy Spirit become righteous, receiving his righteousness. So, complete change again. And then, in the, New, in the Old Testament, you have sin, dominion, death. Because everyone is under the power of sin, the devil, and death. You know, because sin is the death is the result of sin. So when Christ came, he became the victor over sin, over death, and over the devil, and over all evil. So in the New Testament, grace, dominion, righteousness, <coughs> eternal life. So again, a, a completely new thing happened when Jesus Christ intervened on the earth and came to the earth as one of us. And this is taken from, his division is taken from the crucifixion, understanding the death of Jesus Christ by Fleming Rutledge on page 365. So, but it's well, it's well explained because it's all there in Romans if we just stop and think about what it means. It, it's just all encompassing. It's really a new covenant that we are under. And so, when Christ came, all of, the, all of the powers against human beings were completely de defeated. It's called, I guess in fancy words, they call, this, they call it Christus Victor, or I, shouldn't, I don't have the exact word, but it's, it means Christ is victor over everything, over all these evils. <coughs> So when God calls us and, ex and, accept, and we accept the calling, we become liberated from these oppressive powers, from the powers of sin, death, and, and the devil. And we become slaves of righteousness. 
and we grow in the obedience of faith. And it seems like an oxymoron to be a slave of righteousness and say there's freedom. <laughs> but it's the truth. Because in Christ, when we are liberated from the oppression of sin, death, and the devil, then we become free because God is not an oppressor. God is a liberator. And when we, he is, Jesus is Lord, so when we follow in his footsteps, in, his, in the grace that he has given us, then it, there's a liberation that, that happens because we begin to live as we were meant to live in this world. And what we read in the, in the scripture reading, we need to realize that Jesus was not talking just to everyone. He was talking to his disciples. And we read that in verse 20. He says, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and, says, and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So again, he's talking to the disciples. He's not talking to the general public here. And the words that Jesus said applied and they resonated very powerfully with the people of his day. So we have to take from that and apply it to our day because we live in a different circumstances in North America. In Africa and other places, they, would, they live under different circumstances. So we take those principles that God is, is, is saying and teaching us, that Jesus is teaching us, and we need to apply them in our life. But as the children of God, we live with a brand new ethic. An ethic that we cannot attain on our own. But let's not get discouraged because we are, empo we are empowered by God's Holy Spirit to live by that new ethic, that new, those new moral values, that new compass, and as taught by Jesus Christ. And we realize that we live in his grace, that God, that Jesus has paved the way, and Jesus has lived perfectly this way of life. And so Jesus, he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be all, that they... Maybe all one. So Jesus is praying not for his disciples there. It's at Gethsemane just before he died. But he's praying for all who will believe in me through their word. So we believe in Jesus by expressing it in words and by our actions, of course. That they may be all, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So we have this relationship, this brand new relationship that Jesus was praying about, that we are in, in Christ, we are included in the relationship of the Father and the Son. And the purpose, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So there's something very beautiful is going to change in Christians in followers of Jesus Christ that will be evidence <coughs> to the world that God is indeed changing people's heart. And that is very important to understand as well. When we look at that, this is very hopeful because we are not alone. In fact, we are in Christ, united to Christ. And then he goes on to say in Luke 27, to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate <coughs> you, to bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you. Now Jesus is not asking anything that he has not done himself. In fact, he's lived a, he's lived a perfect life for all of us. He's our representative in the heavenlies as both the Son of God and the Son of Man in his one person. But Jesus loved his enemies. And sometimes we think of God's enemies and we don't include ourselves, but it includes ourselves because it says that he died for us while we were still his enemies, Paul wrote to the Romans. So that's when he died for us. And he died 
for us before we ever knew who he was. And we have to admit that we were hostile and in opposition to God in our minds and in our hearts and in our actions. We were very self-centered. And when God calls us, he begins to change our perspective. But he sacrificed his life for all of humanity. And humanity, as human beings, we can be very brutal to one another. You know, just extremely brutal. And yet God has called us, and he has carried on his own self, in his own self, all those sins at the cross just to undo them. And he did good to those who hated him, and he blessed those who cursed him. If you remember at the cross, you know, when he looked at the murderers at the foot of the cross, he he, he basically said, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they do. Now, this is an attitude when you realize how brutal the cross was. And these people were brutalizing Jesus Christ in ways that are almost unspeakable as he was carrying the weight of the whole world, the weight of sin of the whole world. And he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. It's just an incredible attitude of love, not only in words, but in action as well. We were in darkness, as God's before, before we were called, and we have been transported into the kingdom of God. Now, we read about that in Colossians 1.13, because it says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. So our ta- status in Christ has completely changed. We were in darkness before, and we've received the blessing of being in the light, of being in the kingdom of God. And although we, we don't see the fullness of it yet, that's the reality of what Christ has made us to be. So that's very important. So as Jesus loved his enemies and prayed for them, we are called to do the same. To pray for those that do not necessarily love us. It talks about that in the next verses, 21 to 31. The one who strikes you on the cheek offer also the other. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Now, what does it mean to turn the other cheek? This is what the... um, the NIV application commentary uh, says um, on page 190 turning the cheek pictures a person slapped on the cheek in rejection the action involves an insult that may well be associated with with removal from the synagogue numerous examples of this kind of, of, of use of violence appear in Acts for example Acts 18, 17, 21, 32 and 23 2. Yet the early church consistently turned the other cheek by continuing to share the gospel with those who rejected them. They have never fought back in kind, but attempted to overcome evil with good. So this is the heart of God. And even in, uh, as, as I read these scriptures, I remember, you know, remember the, the man that was blind from birth. He was rejected from the synagogue just for saying that he believed in the Son of God. That's turning the other cheek. That's, he was slapped in the face, if you will. 
not literally, but physically, and, and not not physically, but literally. But in the Old Testament, sometimes people were just slapped in the face, and when somebody is slapped in the face, it's an insult. But we can be insulted in many other ways with words. And there are still places in the world where professing to be a Christian is a threat to your life, for example, in China, North Korea, Africa. In some, some of the countries in the Middle East, if you profess you're a Christian, you put your life on the line. In North America, persecution is much more subtle for example, some Christian universities have had to lose their funding because they refused to go along with some laws that went that went against what Christ what Christ teaches, and they were attacked through the media and through various things. But they had to continue to love people. They didn't stop functioning. They didn't stop offering their services. And we have the example of, in our own area, of the university here in Moncton, of Crandall University. And sometimes other Christians may, be, may, lose, may, be, may lose promotions or other benefits because they refuse to go along with unethical practices. And they may lose they may not be chosen because they are seen as not playing with the team or whatever it may be, and those things do happen. In our families, it may be that we are rejected because we belong to Christ or people don't visit as much or people feel uncomfortable with us or whatever it may be because we say that we belong to Christ and we follow in his ways. <coughs> and with all those situations, whatever it may be, we are called, told to continue doing good to them, them as opportunities and circumstances present themselves. And we are to do it in, in spite of the fact that they may be very contentious or insulting or contemptuous towards us, looking down upon us as unworthy people. And with the help of God's Holy Spirit, we are not, we are to be driven by the Word of God. Now, none of us is a machine. We have emotions, we get hurt. And when we get hurt, we are not to let that hurt override what God, what the Word of God is telling us. But does it mean that the, the fight stops? No, it doesn't, because there's still a fight there, and there's still a lot to overcome. But through God's Holy Spirit, He empowers us to do these things, because we are driven, if you will, by God's Word rather than from our own thinking our own emotions. In verse 29 and 30, Jesus goes on to say that, and from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic. And the tunic was the long garment worn under the cloak next to the skin. Now, does Jesus say, or is just Jesus instructing those people that they were to go naked? Because what happens if, you, if they ask for your outside garment and if you gave them the tunic you had nothing on afterwards is that was Jesus promoting that well we need to realize that there are various figure of language that we still use today to make a point exaggerations it's they're called hyperbole and a hyperbole it comes from a Greek word meaning excess it is a figure of speech that uses extreme exaggeration to make a point or show emphasis. 
And hyper hyperboles are not comparisons like similes and metaphors, but extravagant and even ridiculous overstatements not meant to be taken literally. So we have examples of he's running faster than the wind. You know, like it's a hyperbole. It's express he's we're just saying that he runs very fast. I don't have to explain it, you get it anyway. <laughs> This bag weighs a ton. You know, we probably all said that, you know, just to say how heavy uh, things are. Or a teenager may say, my dad will kill me when he comes home. Well, he... It happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can happen, but usually it doesn't. <laughs> usually it's an expression of fear of something that they've done wrong. Or she, has his, she, is, she is as skinny as a toothpick. That's a, that just makes a point of, that's a hyperbole. So, as we read these verses, God is not expecting that we park our brains at the door. Just as an example, if somebody you know is addicted to various substances, whatever it may be, and he asks, he begs for money for food, and you say, I will not give you money, but I will give you to a place where I'm going to give you a meal, and the person, the person refuses. Then you know that he's probably wanting money to fuel his addiction. Would it be wise to give money to that person? Would that be to his well-being? Well, of course not. So we have to use... God's wisdom in all of these things. And God does not want to set aside wisdom. And we need to realize that as we read the, God, the, the Bible, the Bible is a reflection of God's mind from beginning to end. And the Apostle Paul wrote, and he clarifies generosity in difficult circumstances. He, say, he said in Romans 12, 17 to 21, he says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is, if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So again, it takes, it takes wisdom to be able to apply. It's not, it's not black and white, is it? it very, very, various circumstances demand different responses. Depends on the relationship with we have with the person. It depends on a whole lot of things. But we are to apply these things. We, we are to recognize the heart of the Father as we follow his instructions. Then he says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that f to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And he goes on to say that if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Sorry about that. It's, uh, um, for s even sinner lend to sinners to get back the same amount. <laughs> And God Jesus, God, Jesus tells us what the heart of the Father is. He tells us that as God's people, we are to go beyond what the world does. We are to give and to, when the occasion presents itself, without expecting anything in return. And we, as we read these verses, we need to remember some of the verses that God poured his love in our hearts 
it says that in Romans 5, 5, it says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So the love of God is already poured in our hearts. We are to express it in action. In the world, people are willing to give to people who they perceive to be on their side or to be friends and all that. But to give to an enemy, that's another situation, isn't it? But we are expected to love people from the heart, even if they don't like us. Now, does it mean that we are to be buddy-buddy with them? No. But it does mean that if the occasion presents itself and they are in need, that we are to be open to help them. It means giving sacrificially for them, to them. And as we give in those circumstances when people are hostile or unfriendly to us, we trust God to reward us, not necessarily in this life, but in the world to come. And I, this is a very high calling that goes completely against our human nature. Because the human nature <coughs> is centered on self. And we, the instructions of Jesus are, are say, well, they're nice. But when it comes to the tire hitting the road and we have to give to an enemy or someone who doesn't like us, then we have to remember the love of God and override our human sentiments that are in us. Sometimes situation may present themselves where it touches a whole congregation and sometimes it touches us in our individual and private life where we have to follow Jesus instructions now as we read these things of turning the other cheek it doesn't mean that we are not allowed to turn to human governments because in Romans 13 it says that human government are appointed authorities by God. So if someone comes and steals in, our, in, in, in my house or your house, it's perfectly acceptable to call the police. <laughs> because our, and we can forgive that person, but it doesn't mean that that person will not follow the punishment of the law. And it does not mean that if we have occasion to help that person, if we see them in the bind that we will not help them, we will help them. That's the calling. But again, we have to be balanced. And, you know, Jesus was called, it was the people that Jesus was addressing were under the Roman empires. They had different laws back then, not as, as we have today. So we have to apply these Jesus instructions with wisdom. It's very important that we do not harbor grudges, revengeful attitude towards perpetrators. You know, if we see them in need, we are to help them, whatever that need may be. I'd just like to share with you a very extreme story that will, but it shows the heart of God for people, it's from the book uh, Insanity of God, the true story of faith resurrected by Nick Ripken. And the names given are changed because you know he doesn't want people to be persecuted where they live. But he gives an example of a person during the reign of Stalin, where people were sent to the gulag for being Christians, for example. And he gave the example of a, a man named Stoyan who was the son of a pastor and so what happened is that they arrested him when Stoyan was 12 years old and they imprisoned his Protestant uh, pastor father 
and his father remained in custody for 10 years. At first, he said, they held him in a secret police place in our city. Every morning, one of the guards would take some of his own human waste and spread it on a piece of toast that he brought to his to my father for breakfast. And so it's horrible, and obviously the man lost weight. And But it, it goes to show the... The attitude of this man. It says more than 10,000 political prisoners died in Stoyan's country during those years. There was little hope that his father would survive his ordeal. Near the end, his guard made one last cruel attempt to break him. They informed the pastor that he was scheduled for execution. They took him outside, tied him to a pole, and offered him one last opportunity to deny his faith. If he would not deny his faith, they told him he would, not, he would be shot. He straightened his back, stood tall, and declared, I will not deny Christ. The guards became furious with him. Evidently, they did not have the authority to carry out their threat of execution. And even, even, evidently, they had actually been given very different orders. They continued to insult him and curse him even as they began to untie him. Then, much to his surprise, instead of escorting him back to his cells, they took him into the prison wall, outside the prison wall, unlocked the gate, opened the door, and literally threw him out of the prison without a word of explanation. Now, he goes on to say, one Sunday, a few months later, an elderly woman asked the pastor for help. He did not know her. She told the pastor that she had a diabetic son, a son who had recently gone blind and was now close to death. He needed medication to manage his agonizing pain. Unfortunately, as a believer, there was no way for her to get that medication for her son. Stroyan's father promised to try to help acquire the medication, and eventually he was able to do that. When he took the medicine to the old woman's apartment, she led him into the bedroom to introduce the pastor to her son. She was grateful for the medicine, and she wanted the pastor to pray for her son. When Stroyan's father entered the room, he got the shock of his life. Instead, the blind, invalid, middle-aged man lying helpless in the bed before him was the prison guard who had spread human waste on the pastor's breakfast toast every morning for the first nine months of his imprisonment. Oh Lord, do not let me fail now. Do not let me fail you now. Stoyan's father prayed beneath the, his breath. <coughs> without, I, without identifying himself or saying anything that might give away the connection, the pastor granted his former tormentor forgiveness in his own heart, helped the old woman administer the medicine, the medicine to relieve the man's pain, pain, prayed for her son, and then returned home awed by the new and deeper understanding of God's grace. In fact, he was so overwhelmed by God's grace that the experience changed his life and the, and, and the lives of, fam of his family members. And I thought about this example that had touched me so much and God brought it to mind this morning. And I thought, you know, that expresses the heart of God the Father towards people who are enemies better than we can ever think of and God may put us in circumstances where we will have to face some of these circumstances as well and we have to remember that we are our father's children we are the son of the most high who is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil we are to be merciful even as our father is merciful and we cannot do this on our own strength. So let us pray for the faith and the love to express this action, this loving action, to those who are not nice to us, who are opposed to us, either as a church or individually, to the praise of our great Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray.